So uh, I'm a nanotechnology person, and uh, most of us in this field uh, look to this lecture, which was given uh, a couple years before I was born, uh, by uh, Richard Feynman, who's a professor, who was a professor at, in physics at uh, Caltech. And before there was TEDx, or TED, <laughs> There was the after dinner speech. <laughs> and so he was giving an after dinner speech, which he called, there's plenty of room at the bottom. And it really, for us in the nanotechnology community, we use this as basically our uh, founding lecture, we consider. And so most of us, being erudite professors, will call out uh, Richard Feynman as leading our field and sending us in this direction of making things really small and making them functional at that size, what we call nanotechnology. But actually, this is the one that I saw when I was a kid. Uh, and you'll notice that this uh, is a, from The Cat in the Hat Comes Back, Dr. Seuss book. How many people read it? OK, that, the few that are willing to admit it. The rest of you did read it, I think. You just don't, don't want to admit it. That's OK. I make my students read it. So in this story, <laughs> um, The Cat in the Hat is like made this big stain. And it's not a chemical stain. I'm a chemist. It's not a chemical stain. But it's a stain. And so he's trying to clean it up. And uh, to clean this stain up, the cat takes his hat off. And there's a cat on his head. And that cat is half the height of the first cat. And that's cat A. And if you see in the illustration here, uh, Ted Geisel, Dr. Seuss, goes down the alphabet. And each cat is successively smaller and smaller. And that's really nanotechnology. And, and trust me, because I did the math. And if you look at this thing and do the calculation saying <laughs> that the cat in the hat is six feet tall, and so cat A is three feet tall, how tall is cat Z? You can get all the way through the alphabet, and it's there for you. It's 27 nanometers. And in this field of nanotechnology, 27 nanometers is nanotechnology, range of about one to 100. But what Dr. Seuss caught, and Richard Feynman didn't, at least I don't think so well in his lecture, uh, was that that cat number Z, although it's small and it's nano, it actually has a function. It has eyes and ears and, and a nose and mouth and hands, and it can move around, and it can do things at that level that the bigger cats can't. And in the case of the story, the, the small cats help clean up uh, the stain. So uh, another book I read uh, when I was a little bit older, uh, uh, iRobot series by Isaac Asimov, great science fiction writer. And uh, as he was putting his stories together, he formulated these ideas, what he called his three laws of robotics. Um, and they were the laws that basically kind of defuncted all of the, uh, the best plots for science fiction movies. First one, robots can't do anything bad to people. Uh, second, they have to obey people. And third, uh, the robot then, OK, given that you're helping everybody else out, now if something bad's about to happen to you, you can protect yourself but you have to follow them in, in order. So the first law is don't injure humans. Um, so uh, if you look around, now let's go into the current, current era today. Uh, if you go onto the web, you can find this. Uh, this is, I found this on the web. Uh, and it's got everything we're we just talked about. It's nano and it's a robot. And so I, I ordered these things and I bought them and I brought one with me <laughs> right there. I was amazed. I was thought, God, how am I going to open this package and find this nanotechnology thing? And it turns out it's actually quite large. And I'll just let it go there. Um, and so it's sort of a robot, but it's not really nano. So if that bug were nano, what we consider by our definition nanotechnology, it would be about a million times smaller. So that's equivalent to my height stretching from here in San Diego to Seattle. Okay, so that, that ratio is about a million. And that bug should be a million times smaller to really be nano. Uh, really, we're talking about the thickness of a human hair divided by a thousand. And you know, if you don't believe me, try the Dr. Seuss experiment yourself. Okay, you can do it really easily. Take a piece of paper, rip it in half, and then rip that piece of paper in half, and do that 26 times, and see what you've got. And that's going to be nano. Uh, it's not as easy as it sounds. <laughs> okay. So as I started working, going through my career in nanotechnology. Uh, I decided I wanted to do this, and probably because of the inspiration as I was a child reading that story, at least one of my inspirations. And, and so uh, as I got into this field, and I've been working in this field now for about 25 years, uh, I formulated my own laws for robotics, but they're laws for nanorobots. Uh, the first one, very similar to the second law, 
uh, go where you're told to go, uh, and that is basically obey humans. So the first law. Uh, second one, do what you're told to do, so obey humans also. And then three, go away and don't leave a mess behind you. And that's not in the uh, laws of robots, and that's because, where'd he go? Um, well, fortunately I brought another one. So if we do find him again, we can do this. <laughs> it's okay, he's very harmful. It's he's not easy to harm, but I can also pick it up and turn it off. And that's something you can't really do to a nano material or nano object, something that's really down a thousand times smaller than the thickness of a human hair is kind of hard to pick up. And so that's why, where my third law comes from, which means you need to go away on your own. You need to self-destruct. So this has all been stories in science fiction. Uh, now let's go into the real world. Uh, actually, we are using nanotechnology today. Uh, this is a, a, something I also found on the web. This is a website for a drug called Abraxane. It's a very effective anti-cancer drug for women with breast cancer. Uh, and it's actually a nanomaterial. It's a nanoparticle. Um, and it's a uh, picture shown here. It's a, an, an albumin. Uh, serum albumin is a protein that is naturally abundant in the human body. So it's actually compatible with the human body. But they make it in a package, a nano package, a nanoparticle. And they load it then with this thing called paclitaxel, which is a anti-cancer drug. Very, very toxic drug. In fact, that drug won't work very well if you just give it to the patient on its own. So the advantage of putting it into a nanoparticle is that that nanoparticle can actually swim around through the body like a little robot, and it can find the diseased tissue. And what I'm showing here on this image is a picture of a mouse with a tumor in its mouse. And that mouse was injected in its, in its blood system were nanoparticles. And those nanoparticles actually lodged into the tumor of the animal. Uh, and you can see that there. It's labeled as a tumor. And so that's really cool. And the reason it does that is actually because tumors grow very quickly. And blood vessels that feed those tumors grow very haphazardly. And those blood vessels are leaky. They're, they call them permeable. And so these nanoparticles, as they go through the, the body, they don't go through normal blood vessels. They just bounce off the walls and keep going. But when they encounter the blood vessels close to the tumor, they actually leak out and get into the tumor, and that's why you can see them there. And when they're there, then they can deliver that therapeutic more effectively. The, the drug basically is delivered to the tumor and kills the tumor, and hopefully doesn't kill the rest of the, the animal, the person. Um, but another challenge in nanotechnology is what you see lit up on the bottom of that animal, labeled liver, uh, and that is that nanoparticles do tend to go elsewhere. And the body's own immune system, and own, own, own basically sewer system, is cleaning everything out of the bloodstream, and those nanoparticles come with it. And so they can then become toxic to the liver. And so that's where chemistry comes in, because we don't have the little radio-controlled devices to move our nanoparticles around in the body. We actually use chemistry. And this is a, an animation that I got from a very dear friend and collaborator for 15 years, Sangeeta Bhatia, who was working with Erki uh, Ruoslati, both uh, professors and both medical doctors. Sangeeta works at MIT. Erki's at the Burnham Institute. Erki makes little molecules called peptides uh, that have very specific functions in the body. It turns out those peptides can recognize regions of the body. He calls them zip codes. And those molecules can find their way to tumors or other parts of diseased tissues very selectively. And so it avoids that liver problem. Um, and that's more or less what you try to do with a nano robot, right? So what are our rules here? You know, go where you're told to go. That's a big part of it. Uh, do what you're told to do, deliver a therapeutic. Uh, this, is, this is a nanoparticle, too. Uh, and I just gave you the formula for that. So anybody want to tell me what that is? Uh, OK, well, OK, I'll translate for you since I'm a chemist. Uh, Na, sodium, like in sodium chloride, you know, you eat salt all the time. Fe2O3, that's rust. FeO is a different kind of rust. SiO2, silicon dioxide, glass, or beach sand. So chemically speaking, this, this nanomaterial is quite harmless, speaking of just the chemicals. In fact, our body needs all these chemicals to basically grow and, and, and function. Um, but when you put them into that nanoparticle, you make asbestos. <laughs> so this is what we call a natural nanomaterial, a natural nanoparticle. It's a nanoparticle that basically was made in the furnace of the Earth, and it gets into your lungs if you breathe it in. 
And people who get mesothelioma, which is a, a cancer, a disease you can get from breathing in uh, uh, asbestos, will uh, present with the symptoms and will sometimes acquire the disease uh, 10 years or 20 years later. And they haven't been exposed during that period of time, but those little nanoparticles are still in their lungs, scratching away, creating lesions and ultimately causing the cancer. And so the problem with this nanoparticle, it doesn't follow my third law. It doesn't go away. And, you know, I've been talking mostly about nano, what we call nanomedicine, but ultimately what we've learned over the years, over the last hundred years, basically everything we make in the artificial world, in the synthetic world, is going to end up in the environment. If it ends up in the environment, it ends up in your food, in your water, and in the air we breathe. And so that's another reason that I think the most important law of nanotechnology is go away. Uh, so Sangeeta and Erkki and I, my teachers, uh, have taught me how to make nanoparticles and, and make them go away. And this is an animation of a silicon nanoparticle, silicon oxide nanoparticle, very similar, chemi very similar chemical composition to that asbestos that I showed you. But the key thing about that material is that it's got holes in it. Nanotechnology methods, tools that we developed in nanotechnology drilled those holes in that material. And just like a house that gets eaten by termites, before the termites get in there, the house is quite stable and it doesn't go away even in very strong winds and very heavy weather or earthquakes. Once the termites eat holes in that nanostructure or in, in, the, in the house, the house will degrade, fall apart. And that's what we're trying to do in nanomaterials too. So by drilling those nano holes in that material, we cause it something that would normally stay, you know, we make windows out of silicon dioxide. It would stay forever in the body. We make it so it can actually dissolve away in, in the body in anywhere from four days to eight months. So it's amazing what you can do with just drilling some small holes. So uh, that's my story. I just want to tell you three important things. We talked about go where we're told, you're told to go. And in my translation of that, or in the sort of more scientifically way, way of putting it, is uh, in the medical field, we say don't, no off-target effects, which means uh, you don't want the drug to find its way somewhere else. You know, if it's going for the heart or a cancer, don't go into the brain by mistake and do something bad. Do what you're told to do, so release a drug, uh, detect a disease of some sort, and finally go away and don't leave a mess. And really that means that the nanostructure has to degrade. So I started my story telling you about Richard Feynman, and I told you that he was uh, a leader in our field, and he, was, he definitely was, and, and I don't want to make too glib of a point of that. Uh, you know, our teachers, uh, our, our, our scientists, the ones who, who teach us, the ones who mentor us in that field, they teach us how to think. They teach us how to think critically, and they teach us how to solve problems. And my mentors, like Sangeeta Bhatia, and uh, her and Erki Ruizlati have taught me a lot in this field, and they're my mentors. Uh, but more importantly than that, really, are our writers. Uh, because the writers, like the Dr. Seusses of the world, the Neil Stevensons, uh, Isaac Asimovs, they're the ones that teach us how to dream. Thank you. <laughs>